As London begins to wake up, our poker game continues to play out here at Les Ambassadors. With 12 hours remaining, the end is in sight. But who will be the big money winner here at the Party Poker Big Game? This is the biggest game in town and some of the best in the industry are battling it out over pots worth thousands of pounds. They're all fighting fatigue and a bid to be the top dog at the table. Night and day have merged into one as our group of players have battled far more than fatigue. The pressure enormous. 48 hours of action has rapidly diminished as we head into the closing straight. The eight men around our table really do reflect the ebb and flow of this game. Justin Bonomo has been here once before and suffered the indignity of a player eviction. Robert Williamson III suffered a similar fate. Evicted first time around, this time he's left of his own accord and in profit. You know what, if they vote me off again, I'll stick around for round three if they'll let me. Ellis Rubin has a fearsome reputation and it was certainly justified as he clocked up nearly 40K in profit. Isaac Haxton has been here once before, but as with the others, he's back for more. I'm pretty impressed with Viffer and Neil for being able to play for going on 48 hours straight. I definitely couldn't do that. Viffer is the only man who has stood the test of time. Aggressive play has proved both costly and rewarding. I get this like serious bluffing condition and I just can't stop doing it. Channing would have joined Viffer as a stalwart of the table, but an eviction denied him a continuous run. He's back. Paul Zimbler, the latest recruit, is still waiting to make his mark. Phil Locke has struggled to get out of first gear, but he's weary of his opponents. Viffer is on hypo aggro ballisto mode, if there's a gear for that, and Channing is in old school talk him into calling for all crazy, it's a great game. The hard, cold facts are here for all to see. Viffer is fast closing in on the 100K mark, a remarkable achievement, but he's been here from the start. No one really gets close. Channing is at 11 and Locke at four. They're the only two in profit. Justin Bonomo having a torrid time, losing nearly 30K, whilst Ruben flying at one point, fast slipping into the red. Justin Bonomo's uh, history is Pretty well documented. I mean, he's kind of grown up, uh, really grown up uh, along with internet poker when he was, you know, if it was 18 or 19 or something, he got embroiled in sort of a scandal that really redefined a lot of the rules and boundaries of internet uh, internet poker. And he, he took a bit of a took a bit of a brutal uh, public relations beating for a couple of years and. I think you know it, 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 it as it usually happens. Dust. I don't know if you know about it, but uh, he he's come out of it as sort of like the guy who's almost an ethical standard bearer for some of the things in poker. Uh, well, you know, he really took the right approach when that uh, issue came up. You know, he he admitted it straight away and uh, and uh, you know apologized and, and did the right thing. And you know, everyone's not perfect, but if you kind of reach out to your fellow poker players and say, hey, look, you know, I kind of messed up here and. Uh, you know, you're generally going to be greeted a lot differently than if you try to hide things and stuff. So, uh, you know, and, and, and a lot of great things came from online poker out of it. And, you know, he's just a kid at the time, and just uh, he's, he's seems to be a great dude. Yeah, and, and it, it is sort of funny how internet poker has has grown up, and that it's obviously so many similarities live poker, but also so many different ethical boundaries uh, that are that are still happening. I know, uh, I know. Um, you're very involved in that kind of stuff even even now. Yeah, the rules are sort of always evolving and what's Check. acceptable and what isn't. And Check. Bottom line is you just got to try and do the right thing and generally be in good shape. <laughs> Funny sort of hand here. Um, two players have folded the 7-9, which would have been the nuts on the flop. So both Zimbler and Locker are sort of banging their head on the table. But um, not much action in it besides that. Yeah, Viffer's picked up a nice draw here, and a nine or a king could give him an extraordinarily strong hand. Ruben's uh, getting a little curious. He's figuring he could have a lot of hands like uh, 
Definitely could have a lot of hands like King Jack and you know flush draws, but it's it's a pretty optimistic call. It, it is, and one of the better cards from his point of view, and that was probably the best possible result from his point of view. The the trick, and I think, yeah. I think Viffer figured that you know one that that ten might have just made him uh, three tens on the river, and secondly that he still can't beat a number of draws that uh, Reuben could have come along with. So. Uh, he just took the showdown with Ace High, and unfortunately uh, for Viffer, it didn't quite work out, but <laughs> looks like Ruben made a pretty good call there. Welcome back to the big game here at Les Ambassadors Casino. Nearly 35 hours played in this 48-hour cash game. Viffer still trying to get near that 100K mark. Things not looking good for a bunch of players in the red. Among them, Paul Zimler, the most recent recruit to the table, but Bonomo, the player, really in trouble. Yeah, nobody knows Rolex. Yeah. Raise up to 225. <coughs> Call. Call. So, uh, oh, you just, you know, the button's the best spot to pick up these hands, isn't it? Best, best spot to pick up any hand. Oh, it most certainly is, and Isaac is... Uh, most certainly be making a uh, re-raise here. Raise up thousand. And how has he sized it? He's he sort of sized it to get called here, hasn't he? Yeah, he sized it a lot uh, better. We were talking about some of the other players who were making these massive re-raises with pairs against, you know, against uh, uh, the Rubinator who calls uh, fairly liberally. It's probably a good idea, but against most other players, you don't mind the action with kings. So. Yeah. Looks like he's going to get some. These Viffer. two players know each other very well. Yeah, they do. They do. Um, Viffer was about to, to compete with the 6-7 suit and decided not to. Not sure why. Um, and Bonomo's buried. This will be really kind of exciting yeah. to see how these guys match up with these two quality type of hands. It would be interesting to figure out uh, how long it takes Bonomo to... Uh, to uh, know he's beat here. Well, with respect uh, that he has for Haxton, I mean, it, it's going to be really hard for him to take anything over other than a check call line, at least for the first street or two, right? Yeah, I mean, there's not going to be a whole lot of value in him kind of betting out. He might as well, uh, yeah, just take sort of a check call line. And, you know, it's going to probably take him at least a street or, you know, a couple streets to figure out that, uh, you know, he's crushed. Haxton right now is obviously computing bet size. Is it a guess? I mean, what's, what, what, what kind of things are going through his mind right now? What are they saying, rounders there? <laughs> Pipe dreams of going to Vegas in the Mirage. <laughs> he's got, uh, he's got three kings here, and he's just trying to figure out exactly how much he can uh, extract from uh, Justin. Guessing it's a call. It is 1600 bet and call. It's two thirds of the pot, um, and you know this same bet. Well, now what has that done? Well, this card is probably going to be the best thing that ever happened to Bonomo. It's going to save him a lot of money. Uh, Haxton, Haxton. My guess is, is it's going to be a tough call between him betting for value and, and uh, maybe going for some pot control. Because the ace of diamonds is on the board, so much more likely that Bonomo has. Uh, uh, a pair of aces than a flush. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, unless Bonomo has a hand like Queen Jack of Diamonds or something, you know, he's not really going to have a, uh, you know, a, a, a flush uh, too often that goes with uh, any other card on the board. So um, it looks like he's still getting looked up. Right, and uh, you know what does Bonomo put Haxton on, and does Bonomo is he computing bluffing outs? What if a diamond pops? Well, I mean, and that's a terrible card horrible. for for Bonomo because 
Now he's basically at the king kicker, and he's only behind flushes, uh, aces, and kings. And I guess ace king specifically as well. So. And what was the bet? The bet size was like forty five hundred. Um, All in. Yeah, it's just uh, that's brutal. Now the effective, the effective bet is thirteen thousand seven hundred, which is what Bonomo has here. Um, Bonomo knows pot. that Haxton's more than capable of taking a hand like eight seven of clubs and playing it this way as well. So uh, this is why you know he feels like it's a pretty sick spot. This could be an easier easy fold against a lot of nittier players, but against uh, I would never bet you, you know a friend and, and somebody who he has a lot of history with, presumably this is uh, this is a pretty sick spot for Bonomo. Effectively, I think. Haxton was putting, you know, the 13,700 and about 14,600. So basically a pot size bet on the river, which gives him the two to one. And Another factor that could be in play is since Bonomo started the session uh, down quite a bit, he could be, you know, on his last legs for how much money he's brought over here. So this could be his, you know, <coughs> his sort of case money on this trip here. And and how do you compute the fact that uh, tell. so often Bonomo has to <coughs> has to be calling to splitting? He he has to have hands he can beat to call, right? Yeah, and I think uh, you know, like I said, Isaac could could take any hand and turn this into a total bluff. So, and he knows that you know it's very unlikely that. Uh, Haxton would do this with a, you know, a hand like, you know, a made hand or just turn a, a hand like uh, ace-10. Well, you know what, he is, uh, you know, having said that, he, it is possible that Haxton could take a hand like ace-10 and, and put Bonomo squarely on what he has, like an ace-queen, ace-jack, and try to uh, move him off the chop. The only reason I don't think that's too likely is I think hands like that uh, for Haxton would have checked the turn for some pot control. Uh, so I think this is sort of like a nuts or a bluff situation. Okay, I call. King's hole. Yep. And uh, wow. I wonder... I wonder what the straw was for Bonomo there. You'd love to know the thought process he had. Um, and obviously a lot of it has to do with what he knows about Isaac, and it's probably a lot of personal stuff, but bam. He's, took it, he's taken it well, but uh, basically got stacked off there and is now, you know, he's now down a pretty pretty sizable amount. And, well, uh, you know, these guys, these guys good friends, but at this table, at this table, they're playing each other hard, and that clear evidence of it. Absolutely, there was no give up in uh, no. Justin there, and you know he shouldn't uh, he shouldn't feel bad about it there. There's uh, no question <laughs> no, that he's he Isaac's oh, gonna he's gonna pick off a lot of bluffs there as well. Yeah, well, yeah, but it still hurts. It still yeah. hurts. Oh, the, yeah. I mean, there's no yeah. doubt it hurts, but so why is this? Can't beat yourself yeah, yeah, up over the no decision. Problem, yeah. Okay, that's okay. So you want hey, you can make it twenty? Yeah, that's what I yeah. said. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Well, Ruben, oh my gosh. Just, well, it's just not fair. <laughs> Having a look here. Uh, just sort of this idea about in, uh, you know, everyone talks about this two and a half times raise size and that sort of thing. Um, when there's like the straddle, say you got the 25, 50, the 100 and all that, how, how do you size your raise? You're not making it, these guys are making it like 350. Yeah, I mean, it looks like effectively that when the straddle's on there, it's 100, so you're going to have to make it at least 3. And Ruben went out and uh, started at uh, 450, four. Even, yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, and Isaac's gone for the 5 ball here um, to a straddle and a call. Not you, him. But, uh, I, yeah, but you're supposed to play with it. either way, we've got everybody in four ways now. And yeah, you like this. You, you like aces, four ways, two thousand pounds this in the pot. You, you like this. You like. Yeah, this. you just don't want one of those disgusting flops like you know nine seven as six. As long as we don't pay you for your education. All red. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're hoping. You're hoping for something you know like a. 
queen nine three type deal. You don't know what you're hoping for. You're just hoping you win. Uh oh, yeah. and this is oh no problem. Good day for Ellis Rubin, um, as far as this hand's concerned. Yeah, and he's let out for a, a grand. This is a good play here. It's it, it could easily induce a raise and swell the pot early. You know, check raise might look uh, might might kind of come off like a nuts or bluff situation. Isaac might slow down a lot, and it looks like he's already sniffing <coughs> something out. Yeah, I mean, weird. I, there shouldn't be, but. And what would the, what would the thinking be? Oh my gosh, there's not really that many draws here, so. Well, I think he figures that Ruben's either really strong or he has some marginal hand like 10-9 or something, and he wouldn't mind letting, you know, 10-9 uh, continue to see some cards and risk that it catches up, but maybe being able to extract more value from the hand on later streets than if he just raised and took him off of it right away. Justin was saying that he thinks that Isaac is very big on physical sorts of tells. I don't know if he's picked up something off Ellis. I think not. he just sees little value in raising, and he's just going to call down all three streets. He's not going to get away from it. I'm all in. Well, I didn't see that coming. That's a pretty large bet, and I think... Uh, How much is that? It's it's about 18 into 10. Um, and how do you... Yeah, like, yeah, 20 plus. You said it's the new, the new trend, um, the new fad. Is... Thinking about overbets, is it simply a pot odds deal, or what else is there in play? Well, overbets are kind of weird because they tend to be uh, the nuts or bluffs from people, but there are players now that are actually good enough to make thin value bets with those uh, uh, types of hands as well, so it, it, it's getting a lot more confusing. Yes, nuts or bluffs, but so much more weighted towards nuts than bluffs, or no? Well... It, it's it's going to depend on the player. There are certain players that overpot and they have the nuts 100%. And there's guys that mix it up well. And there's guys that are always bluffing when they overbet. So uh, it's very player dependent. Uh, but getting to this hand, I call. Put sixes. Getting to this hand. Yeah. Well, he got to that hand and he's not liking <laughs> what he saw. How much is it? And uh, that I don't know. That was kind of was it good for the game? I don't know. But you know what? It's uh, it certainly made the game interesting because Ellis Rubin, who was I don't know, he was having a little bit of a momentum problem, right? And they don't have one now. No problem. No, he's uh, he's been chipping up quite nicely. He uh, eight thousand pounds ahead. Um, however, more interesting, the 48,000 pounds he got is basically among the biggest stacks he's had at the table, and to me, that's a that that's a little more interesting because um, it's going to make the pots bigger. Yeah, absolutely. And and to think uh, what he'd have if he didn't kind of have a, that uh, little bit of a meltdown moment there with that a6, uh, this could be uh, he could be uh, really making a run against Viffer. Is it folded? Yeah, for sure, yeah. You wouldn't want to play those. Even I don't play those. Fold. Cool, sorry. See? Thank you. Okay. So, raise up to 1400. Fold. Do you have any big chips behind me? Any five chips? Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm starting to feel a little bad for Bonomo because uh, I don't think there's any way with the. Uh, Paul Zimbler stack size, he gets away from this hand, so I'm pretty sure all the money's gone in here. Right. Yeah. Mm. Viffer made sort of a 400 raise, and Zimbler's made at 1400, so about 6,000 back. And you're saying if, if, if Zimbler was deeper, there'd be a big reason for Bonomo to. Or some reason. Yeah, if they were really call. deep, he'd probably just call and they'd call. play a flop, but. With these stack sizes, the money's going in every time. Yeah, we saw the Viffer folded the jack of diamonds. So yeah. that jack of spades, he's overcoated in the suits. Um, 
is like, wow, FML. Yeah. Oh, oh my! Wow. It's a one quarter. Wow. Well. Well. Tough break for Zimbler. <laughs> what a tough to break! What a tough break! Got the virtual nuts now. Unfair. Wow. Oh, that hurts. Pair on pair, and Bonomo gets the break with his trip, Jax. Zimbler forced to rebind very early on. More to come in the big game four. Welcome back to the big game, and the big news here surrounds the rise and fall, and then rise, of Ellis Rubin. At one stage, he was 40K to the good. He crashed down the leaderboard and into the red. Now, he is back and steaming up the profit ledger. He sums up the tail of this game. Viffer tops the other end of the board, nearly touching the 100K mark. What's that? I want to play you. Don't tease me. <laughs> We, we went through, what did we say? Was there a couple hours where it was just like, you know, there's no pocket pairs, there's no big hands, and then bam, the aces, the ace jack, the sets, the kings. Yeah, the fireworks are starting. Wow. And, so, and uh, Channing has underrepped his hand uh, tremendously here, just limping in with jacks. I don't suspect a limp raise though. I think he will just uh, call. Yeah, it's um, it's a real feature of uh, of his game. I mean, I mean, <laughs> how scared would you be to see Chan getting it all in before the flop, and and you having like the two queens? I mean, uh -huh. you know, I mean, you'd be like, oh god. <laughs> um, well, this is gonna be a tough flop for. Uh, Channing to get away from. <laughs> so Ruben goes for pot control again. But, he he uh, didn't like that flop either. Really? No, I think he fears he that uh, he has a lot of small and middle pairs uh, that he's calling with and suited connectors, and that board pretty much smacks that range right in the face. Channing's having a good think of this. I mean, you know, you're never folding. Um, what is raising a accomplish? I guess that's what he was kind of thinking. You have anything? There you go, you're talking again. I'm just asking. I don't know. Maybe you might tell me your hand. Like, accidentally, you might just blurt it out. Yeah, I have a pair of sevens or something. <laughs> check. <laughs> that might save uh, Channing some money there. Might go check, check. I'm assuming he's just going to take the show down here. I guess I have the best hand. I check. check. Queens. Oh, I think I saved money. Yeah, nice um, <laughs> and you know, he just he had the radar up. I don't know if the radar was up because uh, of the big it. raise by Ruben um, pre-flop. He just always had his uh, his antennae up, and for some reason, you, you think it was uh, Ruben being scared and going for pot control. I don't know. Is it possible he was just trying to be a little tricky as well? I mean, just sort of the whole thing, trying to trap Channing, or no? Well, they're both really week. deep. And uh, <laughs> I think I think uh, Ruben just kind of wanted to play a smaller pot there. Yeah. And I, I don't think he liked that flop. He didn't like if he bet into it, if he got some action, he'd just be in a really sick spot. So I think he just tried to pot control it and maybe look for a few spots on later streets to extract a little value. So yeah. as much as Channing got a, a signal when, when uh, Ruben raised, Ellis raised big, Ellis also knows that when Channing calls a big raise like that, he's not... He's not monkeying around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, he's going to have some type of uh, suited connector. He's going to have a pair. You know, he's not going to just take a hand like ace-10 offsuit and do something like that. And that flop was pretty nasty for the types of hands that Channing would play that way. Call. It's amazing how Channing always seems to lose just about the minimum when he gets in these sort of marginal pair-over-pair pair type 
situations. He's been pretty excellent at controlling the pot. Yeah, he's um he's very good at losing the minimum, and then in some spots he's very good at winning the maximum. All other facets of his game <laughs> are to always seem seem very technically incorrect. <laughs> I don't know how he gets there. It's it is sort of funny. Yeah. He's got his own little methods, you know. So Ruben's going to play his hand. He has position. Figures why not. Stacks are deep. He's got good implied odds. Yeah, these guys, are, these guys are both... Uh, well, Haxon's about 30,000 deep, and Ruben will cover that. So Haxon's really good flop. He's not behind much here. Ace jack and pocket fives would be the really ace five. Other than that, he should have the best hand. We know he's not going to call a raise of jack five. He, he, he's he got 30, so you can see him sort of think, oh, I'll bet three now. That'll put like 10 in the pot. I could bet about seven, you know, and then I can bet the, uh, the remaining 20 on the river. Yeah, I think he's, before he gets, you know, that far, I think he's going to be, uh, you know, rooting for, um, you know, some bricks to yeah, come, you know, maybe up. like a... You know, if the board went 7-7 seven, yeah. seven or something yeah. with no yeah, heart. Yeah, you got half of your money back. Or 3-3 three, three would be another yeah. great one. So he should be able to just fire away here. And uh, Let's be careful. And hopefully get paid off. He could take some type of pot control line, but I just don't see him doing that. I think he thinks he has the best hand. He knows Ruben calls... Uh, fairly wide in a lot of these spots and I think he's just going to try to go to value town. How much more are you playing with? Well, the answer is going to be just over 20 now. Got like 13 or 14 more? Uh, well, and, and by saying that, he sort of, wow. It's pretty suspicious. There are some hands that, you know, he could just be double barreling with. He could have flush draws. <laughs> Can't give away all my secrets. What have you, uh, anything you feel like you're, I know you've seen a lot, watched a lot, Any, but anything in particular you think you're kind of taking away? Uh, you know, something new? Well, I think, you know, the, there's almost not a person I've ever met who is, like, too aggressive. And if you watch, uh, you know, being able to see all the, the hands, uh, some, of course, uh, uh, you know, everyone may not see, but uh, you start to realize that people don't have hands very often, and the more aggressive you are, you're just going to pick up a lot of those small pots, and, and uh, you know, you're going to get paid off a lot more on uh, some of the big hands. Viffer's obviously been a perfect example of, of that stuff. Is you know people just don't have big hands all the time. If you apply some heat to them, they're not going to have a choice but to fold. Bonimbo, uh he hasn't exactly picked up a lot of huge hands, but every time he picks up a hand, someone else seems to pick up a big hand, and it's all he can all he can do to uh, to get some breaks on. Yeah, playing a real marginal hand like this against Viffer is probably the last thing you want to do. But uh, he just can't, you know, fold right away. He's taking the check, check, root on the flop. You want to protect your hand? You want to... Well, you want to. The problem is, you know, it's Viffer, and he's sick enough to, like, you know, you make it 2,000, he might just make it 12 on you. And you're just like, now what do I do? <laughs> but you just can't imagine how he could have a big hand on this turn. After checking the flop. Right. And right now, Bonomo's, if a heart comes, Bonomo's, um, I, I mean, certainly he expects Viffer to have a heart here pretty, pretty often, right? Yeah. If... Uh, yeah, I mean, it, his hand looks a lot like Ace King that picked up a heart draw on the turn, and, and now he's going to, uh, you know, now he made his hand. 
So when Bonomo checks, he's repping exactly what he thinks Bonomo thinks he has. And he knows, and the big side got bad beat. It, Viffer understood sort of the bluffing outs. He didn't really have to think long about what to do there, I did know, he? I never looked. I knew <laughs> I had two looked. red cards. I didn't know wow. which. I didn't know if they were suited or not. Nice hand. So it was 50-50. There's been an empty seat at this table for a while, but yet. not anymore. We'd like to now welcome a new player at the table. It's Barney Boatman. Every hand is an individual event. You know, it's not like a tournament where you can play great or get lucky or whatever for four days and then one hand just wipes everything out. I mean, that can happen in a cash game too, but uh, you know, you, you're, you're far more likely to be re rewarded if you're playing well in cash. Oh, he's gonna be a big smile when Barney Boatman chooses his walk-in song. Great sense of humor, <laughs> 10,000 pounds, and this is a guy who uh, has played in all three, uh, I think, Poker Den cash games. And last time I had, had a, commentated a bunch of times too, Dusty. Last time I had a bit of a rough go, but he's been playing quite a bit of uh, sort of this six max deep stack on the internet. All of a sudden, he tells me, and uh, I think he's pretty excited. Do you know much about I, Barney Boatman? You know, I haven't uh, had a whole lot of experience playing with Barney. I've sat with him a few times, uh, actually, uh, on the internet only. Uh, but uh, uh, he hasn't struck me one uh, uh, particular way that I can remember. But So it'll be kind of interesting to see uh, what kind of style of play he chooses uh, yeah. for I this mean, game. Yeah, I mean, you know, of course, Barney is uh, one of the old original as far as from the from the real growth of poker, real you know, a real tournament player, lots of results around the world. Um, and I think most of his cash game play has probably come uh, playing on the internet, um, you know, in the last couple years, like as a sponsored pro. Um, That's a good way to get a lot of hands in real fast. But he is a, um, he is one of those guys who his first, second, third, and fourth weapons and lines of defense are all instinct, you know? <laughs> he's uh, so I, I quite like him live. He's a, now, sir, he's a crazy a uh, tournament folks. player. Us tired. And you're getting us all excited. Yeah, he's obviously had a lot of success on the tournament trail, so it'll be interesting to see if that uh, translates here to the big game. Oh, Hollywood. Yeah, and, and I'm guessing he knows, well, obviously he knows, uh, you know, guys like Neil Channing and, and, and Zimbler and Locke quite well. I'm just guessing because the number of tournaments <laughs> Barney Check. plays that, uh, you know, he'll have run into uh, Justin Bonomo before. We'll see. You know, I've got a hand. Of busy catching up here, and everyone's hand just seems to get better all the time. Viffers, anyway. Yeah, Viffers, uh, he's for the pot. Quite excited at this point. Yeah, <laughs> 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 I think that was a uh, that was sort of a little bar, was it? Who who's always who keeps asking to get the pot spread? <laughs> <laughs> Add it up, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> who is it? Someone in this someone in this game who just kept them asking and asking. Who is it? I had a flush anyways. <laughs> yeah, he knew he had to bluff Phil. Uh, he probably put him on some type of marginal hand and thought he might get curious. So I think he decided to kind of toy with him. Really? Yeah. So now, like, Phil didn't seem too happy about it. No. It's gone over a hundred grand in profit. Boy, it took him a little while to get those last two or three thousand, didn't it? Wow. <laughs> well, he's he's massive, obviously. And the three fifties come from Lock. All right, so in um, case, my dad discovered some nameless service that tells him when I lose $200,000 <laughs> on the internet, which always makes calling home more fun. It's a, uh, it is one of the things that uh, certain players have had to deal with that uh, 
It's no fun, especially when uh, a lot of these players become sponsored pros and they go from having sort of uh, internet names, which only a few people know, or only those in the no know, uh, no -no, to their names in red, which is thinking all over the internet. So. Exactly. I've you count anything under seven no, that, uh, feeling from first-hand experience. So Viffer here uh, leads right out with his fives. Maybe feels he can get more action that way. And this is a really, really hairy card. This is where Locke could definitely justify making a play since he picks up a monster draw. Yeah, and Locke has made a couple plays on this sort of uh, turn card before, hasn't he? Absolutely, and I think Viffer hates that, and that's certtainly an action killer card, but Viffer's got a better for value. And <laughs> One thing he wouldn't expect, or maybe I wouldn't expect it, I wouldn't expect Locke to put in a bluff raise on the river. That's not something I'd expect Locke, and we've seen it happen several times tonight, but not from, or not that I can remember from Locke. Yeah, it would be a pretty unusual spot, and there's a lot of decent reason to suspect Viffer might even have a hand like that, so he doesn't want to try and represent what Viffer already has. But it thinks could have got ugly for Phil there if he had to raise the turn. You know, he probably would have got repopped back and been in a pretty gross spot with his uh, monster draw there. Must have been the bet size that uh, scared him off. Was gonna get kind of expensive. I don't know. Something else. Just, just good instincts. Yeah, I think he thought maybe if uh, some of those nasty cards came, such as the one that did come on the uh, river, that possibly Viffer might might check and and uh, Phil could represent that as well. So I think he just chose to not swell the pot too much and put himself in any ridiculous positions. So Locke's made this 300. I guess. Sorry, Haxton's made this 300. Zimbler's made this 15. And and Locke is called, and now it's. That's the real confusing part. Okay, that's part the real confusing action, part. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's, it's, it's the it's the 1500 call from Locke. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Otherwise, he'd just put uh, Zimbler in, and they'd go off and flip a coin for a bunch of money. Okay, so uh, more, more of a reason now. Oh, I think it's you know okay. what it is. I'm sorry. Locke raised first, sort of under the gun. Um, Haxton called and then Zimbler's raised. Now it's come back around to Haxton, who could put a weird kind of squeeze in, which is what he's done. Yeah, that's so exactly it's even, what he's done. So right. he's just made a bet that kind of commits himself to Haxton, but not to Locke in case Locke right. decides to go insane. Here. He, okay. <laughs> this. Pull in the 12s to start. Pull in 12. And, and, and 12 uh, Zimbler's here. gone <clears throat> straight all in because he never had much there, money to begin with. Um, yeah. So now the question is, because what Locke obviously wants to know right now is if he calls, can Haxton re-raise? And if the answer is yes, Locke will have just done 1,500 pounds, <laughs> right? I mean, that's basically what's going to happen that's here. That's basically so if I call 34 and a quarter, can he raise? Yeah. Yes, he can. And now that he's asked, he really hates it. He's just, yeah, he's just done 1,500 pounds. He's okay. I think he's putting on a little bit of a show here. Can't imagine why. Yeah, he knows exactly what happened. What's going on here? So what happened was uh, Haxton was a little bit worried about Locke, but once Locke didn't isolate, all of a sudden he he was pretty sure that he could start to to get it in against Locke. It got shopped. You want to run it twice? You want to run it once? What it makes no difference to me. Wait till the river. We can decide on the river. How's that? Is that good for you? It's better for you. Okay. 
Okay, yeah. <laughs> Deal out four of them. <laughs> <laughs> Stop! I, I don't care Stop. a bit. Stop! Oh my Jesus. god. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Simpler did that. What did he say? Two turns, one ripper. He really said that, didn't he? I mean, what is he talking about? <laughs> what was he talking about? <laughs> oh, wow. Oh my god. That is sick. Wow. Oh, wow. Only a 3%. Chance wow. on a flop there. The Zimbler won this. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's about the best flop you can hope for if you're. It's Jack's been lucky all today. I mean, maybe, you know how you run it, Roger. Right? Isaac said, I didn't care. So Zimbler said, Let's run it out to the turn and then decide. So I said, okay. And then you're like, what? And then he said, two turns in one river. And then you were like, what the hell are you talking about? Welcome back to London for the big game. Viffer finally crosses the 100K mark in his quest for big game immortality. Everyone else is trailing in his wake, most in profit apart from Zimbler, Haxton, and the unfortunate Bonomo, who is now 45K down on his day's work. They have, uh, you know, you could probably put a bit of a highlight reel together of of all the, 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 the wonderful hands Bonomo and Haxon have played, and yet they just, they're just both of them are just buried in this 48-hour cash game. And uh, I'm not happy about it. I'm not saying that, you know. But I think that it's, it's great in a sense, and they can take it. I know they can take it. It's great in a sense because it shows the... Uh, the variants yeah, yeah, of poker. You, you knew you were bluffing, right? You knew you were bluffing. Oh, it sure does. And I think they're two. These are two guys who understand it pretty clearly. Well, I think a lot of people watching poker on TV just assume the best player wins every time, and it's just not the case. It's poker's uh, one of those things where you kind of evaluate results at the end of the month or even end of the year, uh, depending on how frequently you play. Even in a deep stack cash game, and you know, in these deep stack cash games, the best players don't always get it in good either, right? I mean, you know, no. there, there's certain times it just happens, you know, like um, like the way Haxon reacted when uh, when Ellis Rubin just stacked him off completely with the three sixes. Yeah. I mean, he just, you know, got owned there, but uh, that's, that's the way it is, you know? That's the way it goes. Yeah, I don't think he's going to lose any sleep over it, just that's the way it goes sometimes. And uh, Locke is in the tank right here because uh, he made a little raise. Viffer re-raised. Ruben, sorry, Ruben re-raised. Viffer made the re-re-raise with the ace-queen. And now th this constitutes as Locke slow playing the kings. Yeah, this is a little bit of a slow play here. But I think he's just worried if he re-raises, then he really forces Viffer to have an actual hand. And... What do you think, what range do you think Viffer's putting him on here? I think he's got him probably on a hand a little bit more marginal, kind of like the hand he has, like an ace queen or pocket nines through jacks, you know, and, and then a lot of other just random stuff because you know it's Phil Lock after all. <laughs> and quick call, at at what what point is Viffer starting to say, "Ooh, I don't know if I can get him off this," or should we go one more time? Yeah, it's hard to say if I don't know if Viffer ever thinks that. <laughs> Well, because, you know, if it is nines, if it is nines, three barrels should do it, right? <laughs> yeah, you would think. You would think. I would, I would not want to have, uh, I would not have a lot of fun trying to call with three nines there against Viffer on three, three streets. Locke has done really well here. Uh, yeah. Would you agree? Yeah, he's played the hand really well, and uh, he's confused. He's wondering... Biffer's confused, wondering if he can uh, take him off the hand. Phil's is, hand looks real marginal. Is is Viffer thinking? Is it fours? Is it a flush draw? Uh, is it is it ever kings here in Viffer's mind? Is it ever kings? It's kings here. I mean, it's kings here very rarely. That's sort of the top end of his range. Yeah, because I mean, the reason it doesn't seem to be kings here, we've never seen Locke play the kings like this. Yeah. 
I think uh, I think the ten might have actually saved him. I think he has him on pocket nines through jacks and is worried oh. that. Uh, all in. Wow, and he goes all in. E e e Can He's I? He's making a super thin value. You're gonna win. Well, I I was just kind of thinking. If he if he if he makes a bet that Viffer can so bluff a, raise over the top well, of him, doesn't that give a little more flexibility, or is that just no? Which is we know. Viffer's yeah, it's hand. one of those spots where it might be a little bit too optimistic of a play, and I don't think you're going to expect to get check raise there with air too often. And if Phil Lock did bet small and then get check raised, he might throw up in his mouth a little. <laughs> yeah, but he just went all in. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean. It's one thing to like put it all in and go, oh shucks, like I ran. Viffer takes a step back. Phil Locke, the big benefactor of that clash with Viffer, and doubles up. No break for Bonomo, over 45K down, and deciding to call time on the big game. The second session was a little frustrating for me. It didn't really catch many cards. I ran into some unfortunate situations. Uh, probably made a bad call in the river against Isaac. Uh, overall, I think I'm just really sleep deprived and wasn't really playing my best. An empty seat rarely stays that way in the big game. Next time up, we see the return of Bodo. The last time I played this event, I was the unknown, and it's good to play as an unknown because you know everybody, but nobody knows you. So this time I have to give attention to the players, and they know I can play pretty aggressive, and then maybe I, I should pl play just solid poker. Bodo, the next man into the fray, he's had a taste of big game success in the past, but now he's a known quantity and there will be no let up as he attempts to repeat his previous winning performance in the party poker big game four.